ADBN Advocate Broadcasting Network. Faith is the demonstration of absolute trust in the midst of unforeseen realities. One Faith is a program designed to bring you stability in your journey of faith in God. Oh, <laughs> 
But I go to make allowances for them. So I do not know if you also did something that you are not used to doing. If you go back and you put these words into practice, I want to believe God that by the time we're done with this show today, you'll be able to do something you're not used to doing just because you have God's word and you are eager to please God. First of all, do you have an experience you can share with us? There's something no, that you're not used to doing. No, I, I think that's my entire life. My entire life lives like that. Oh, my God. It's the first time, you know, you're going yeah. you to find people on the street who say, just pass for just, I'm just need a meal. Oh, and I have experience on Friday that really, really got me worried. Got me really, really worried. The weather in the street is a time span of like one hour. I have called for case of, from case of 10 people. Wow. And everyone is saying, Pastor, I'm broke. Pastor, I had a meal. My family is broke. Wow. And I was wondering in my mind, how do I help people? And so I took my last and shared it among people. Now, I that you will say, okay, let me have something back because you don't have a meal at all. You're going to be able to, you know, buy a few things, go to the grocery store. But I just gave out everything. And I just walked away feeling like, God, this is my all. How am I going to go through the weekend? And before I knew it, God just supplied all of my needs. And I was so excited that I was able to meet the need of someone. And for me, what excited me more was the prayer that the people began to pray. Yeah. People began to say, Pastor, God bless you. Pastor, God will empower you. But I mean, you know the power of the widow. Mm-hmm. The prayer of the widow is remarkable. So I want to encourage you that sometimes it's good to go out of your way and do something you've not done before. That is the story of my life. I live like every day making sacrifices to people. And, uh, and, and for me, it, it goes on to ask to ask me one question. What drives you? Yeah. What drives you? You know, when you get on the street and you meet people or you're in your office, what drives you? Are you driven by greed? Are you driven by take? Are you driven by, by loss? Are you driven by hatred? Yeah. You know, whether you like it or not, you know, and in this economy, you're going to have people come to you to make demands of you. Your children, your husband, your wife, people are going to call you and say, do this for me, do this for me. And many times we feel like, why is it bothering me? Am I the only one in the world that will be demands on you? And uh, it looks like they're all pain and sacrifices. But I'm telling you, when you're driven by love, you will see what people are going through. You know, when you're driven by love, you're going to look at someone and see. You know, Jesus saw them in one scripture and said he had compassion, compassion. for that thing. And so you need to learn to have compassion. You need to be driven, not driven by loss, not driven by pride, not driven by selfishness for yourself. Yeah. You need to be driven by something that you can make a difference in someone else's life by just doing something out of the normal. So for me, it's key. I, I got excited. You know, when you, when you do good to someone, there's this sense of fulfillment that you have. Oh, I'm glad I was able to be a blessing. You know, Dorcas in scripture reminds me of the virtue of giving. The Dorcas, you know, so the, the people organized a visit to the apostle. And they got Peter there. And the Bible makes me know that they came with the clothes that she made. They came with the things. They, yeah. She had fundamentals. She had tangible things that she had done to people's lives. So I kept telling people, on the day of your demise, what would people say about you? What would they, what would they, what would they say that this is what you did? So you changed me. You changed my life. That's why the other side box woman came with that box and broke it and said, this guy changed me so I can afford to cry. So I agree with you, I did some things. You know, when we talk about love, some people readily make excuses for themselves. Yeah, they yeah. tell themselves, I do not have money to give. Yeah. And sincerely, they do not have money to give. Yeah. But the one thing we fail to understand or balance is the fact that you do not only have to give money. Yeah, Giving true. is not only money. Well, that is true with the money. You know, Bible talks about it. So love is patient. Love is kind. It is not easily angered. Mm-hmm. It could just be you extending a hand of patience to someone. Mm-hmm. It could just be you forgiving, letting go of hurt, letting go of resentment, letting go of those things that when you remember them, you act in a kind of way that is not pleasant. So it doesn't matter if you do not have money to give. There is always something to be able to give to someone when you want to show love. So we need to balance the fact that it doesn't have to be money. So that you do not have money right now is not an excuse to not show love. You can show love whether you have money or not. Mr. Eva, what do you think about this? Yeah, I want to agree with anything you said, actually. Especially mm-hmm. when the part of you want to Yeah. Your, your time is of value. Your, your, even your emotions, you know, mm-hmm. expressing you don't express yourself to another person is a way to give. So I want to the way that giving is the power of the way that you pass yourself. The way that you give, give your time, give your money, give something. 
you know, that's, that's, that's what makes a relationship beautiful in the giving. I think they were going along the relationship line. <laughs> Because most times, you know, um, as spouses, they just want to have conversations. Yeah. And we are not ready for that. They just want conversation. That's yeah. all. They're not asking for money. Probably because they know at that time, you do not have it. But they need your attention. They need your time. Yeah. And they're just asking you, please, can I have some time? But we're not ready for this, Pastor Bong. They're trying to hit uh, because but if you're doing this whole marriage, you see that this is how God designed marriage to be. Now, we, we don't come into marriage expecting to get. We come into marriage expecting to give. Marriage is between two people who are ready to sacrifice everything to meet the needs of each other. Because marriage is beautiful when there are two people who are madly working very hard to outlove each other. You know what I mean? They are competing. They are trying to say today, okay, I'm going to do this yesterday, I'm going to do this. Because you are looking for a way. The Bible says, provoke one another to love. Provoke. So there's some things you do to me that I'm thinking now, it's amazing. I want to come back, I want to be playing with that thing. So I want to compete, I want to do the very best. And incidentally, it's not just it's not what the, the, the people of the kingdom don't learn to love like this. But the best example of, like, of this kind of love, I learned it and I saw it in people who don't really, really believe in Jesus. Yeah. And that thing really, really got me thinking. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it, there's a transition to be in church and to be a Christian, we end up judging, yeah. we end up losing, we end up being critical of people. Yeah. And for me, that is key. It's very key. But in, in, in my situation, you need to learn to understand that you not only love what we give, we give our lives. You can't mm-hmm. give. If I don't think that God values what you give to Him, if you don't give your life first, it is your life that is more important to God than your money. But what you say, if a man wants to give a gift to God and comes to church with it and has a problem with his wife, yes, that's it, then. Something against somebody, or somebody has something against him. The Bible says, drop your gift there. Don't take it away. your relationship with him is more important than that gift. I don't know that means that people come to church and give millions of naira and go say, I never received that. Mm-hmm. I have no plan with that. You give it, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because God says, I will look at your relationship with me and me people to value your gift. What gives value to whatever you bring to God in terms of service, in terms of time, in terms of sacrifices, is our relationships with people. Love the love that God with all your heart. Yeah. Love the love upwards, but you love people sideways. Yeah. And God says, Your love to me is expressed in your love for someone. So if I love God, I will love IJ naturally. If I love them, I will love my wife. So the love of God flows through my heart and flows to people. You can love people the way God wants you if you don't have God in your heart. It is the God in you. Love becomes our operating system. If you have faith, you are faith by love. If you have patience, this is what about love. Everything is scripture. Praise the one thing that the way our faith is designed and it works only by love. And so it is critical for us to stop judging people. And, and, and I want to learn on this because it is powerful that what your spouse might just need from you. Yeah. The language of love your spouse knows or desires and prays for, is hungry for, is passionately looking for, is P I M E, God time. Yeah. So you spend one hour with your wife and she's all over you. You spend two hours with your husband and she thinks that you're the best of her in the world because love has a language. And those lovers understand how to speak that language. Yeah. 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 Yes, I've never looked at it from this angle. Oh my God! You know, that the time the person says, "Be, be, 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 be,
The one who has theology on one side, and go and witness the Gentile, because God says, my love language is souls. So, when I want to please God, that's the things I do to please God. I'm actually pleasing God right here. Right? So, yeah, that's what I'm so, giving so much so I'm giving out to people. Yeah. So, when we do this together, when we pray for people, that is God's love language. But you see, if I'm going to love my wife, I need to know that my wife loves time. Yeah. And now my wife loves a few things beyond time. <laughs> so, I need to know all those things, and I'm going to give it. So, if we end up becoming factionalized, if we end up becoming judgmental, if we end up becoming like a different titles in, in the church, we have, but it makes us difficult to love each other because we see ourselves as, uh, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of um, the game, I am of inside, I am of the new God. So all those things are the way we look at things and the way we love people. So we come home and we see that in our home, God designed a home to function by love. When you punish your child without love, it becomes a problem. But that child, child would not see your correction as an act of love. So when you call with one hand, we love you with the other hand. So when you don't love your spouse, it becomes a problem because it is key. God designed the home. You know, when a woman is loved, she's always giving you smiles. Mm. She's smiling from you. I mean, her mouth is wide because mm. she has been overloaded with love. So when I read down this, so many marriages have, have lost love. You know, you know, you know I, I, I had to have to sit down with people last week whom they have been married for 13 years. And they sat down with me and they told me the story of how this one has made them angry. And they are very few. They are, they are saying that they want to end their marriage. And I sat down and I listened to them. And I came to the conclusion that this marriage was had love. But they have lost love. And when there's loss of love, everybody will go apart. They go as they will go together. They will hit so wide so well that they begin to see themselves as enemies. And the things they used to do for love, every action now becomes anti-love. So I raise my hand. He hates me. I want something. He doesn't love me. So we see we interpret actions through the eyes of our bitterness. And so I don't want I don't know who has loved love here, but I want to ask you, go back and love your spouse. Mm-hmm. You have no idea how much this this will make an impact in, in your life. I think I I can rest my case now. <laughs> <laughs> I think this must be where you, you know, generated this enemies of love for so long. So because every day there are factors that get to fight against so love. Much, so much. Every day, every day, every day. Because I mean as you relate with people every day, bitterness, joy, love. Hatred, they seem to rub off on you. You know, it's, it's just good to say that there is no conversation or relationship that leaves you the same way. Mm. You know, speaking with you, I get to have faith rub off me. Yeah. There are people you sit with, and by the time you leave that place, you are full of doubts. Mm. You are full of resentment because they have said something that actually has formed an impression in your mind. So, if we're looking at the enemies of love, I think we should be able to, you know, consider. Why do people see you when they look for you? Who do you listen to? What do you feed your mind to? You know, away from offenses, away from resentments and all of that, I think that if you want to be able to let love breathe, you know, around you, you need to be very careful where you are, who you are with, and where you find yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, the first on the list of what I call the enemies of love, what first love between two people, yeah. what first love between you and God. You know, the love of God I have with God, mm-hmm. so you can fight it. It is what I call offense. Okay. You know, Jesus, um, John the Baptist sent for Joseph and said, Please, are you the one we were expecting? Don't forget that the few chapters behind, yeah. when the Baptist had come and said, Now behold the Lamb. The Lamb. He endorsed Jesus. He recommended Jesus. And instantly, John loved the love his disciples. Mm. They loved Jesus. They loved him and joined Jesus. Imagine that I have a church, you have a church, and I endorse your church. And I know that you have a name that's going to do. And the natural thing is going to be that I'm going to see you as my enemy. So I'm seeing you as my friend. And so immediately he loves this. He went for it. It became so bad that John the Baptist, so he sent him words to Jesus. He said, Go and ask him, Are you the one? I have an expectation. But in my life, I can't afford to be in prison. But how can I be in prison? I'm not talking about you. You're not me. You hit me for what I was saying the point. You're going to say, How are you doing? I think Jesus said, Go and tell him 
because I want eyes to see you. I want to walk. I want to give you a testimony. And I know that blessed is he who will offend in me. The story of this creature ended with John losing his life. And I don't want to assume what the Bible is saying, but Jesus, I would have put what he said. It's as if the devil is saying that the reason why John's life is going down is because of what the Bible would call an offense. So many times you get offended, you get seriously offended, and whenever there's an offense in your heart, even in your marriage, it kills the love you have for your spouse. So a lot of people are offended at God. You know, God did not give me a baby when I wanted. People have been praying, I've been for fasting for years. So, so God, God has not answered their prayer. So they become offended in God and they don't come to church anymore. I know people like that. They don't talk about God that exists. Mm-hmm. They have a form of life. They don't think God is anything but good. But how do bad things happen to them consistently and they feel that they have been praying? And somebody told me, Pastor, but I prayed. I prayed, Pastor, I prayed. And they develop such bitterness against God. And because of that, they think and say, God does not exist. And God hates me. They have become offended at Jesus. I said, Whenever there's an offense, it destroys love. In your marriage, in other languages, and between two people, and in your relationships, offense is the key. So, how do we deal with offense? That's why I'm going to ask you because now. I want to ask you the way you deal with offense. I was going to ask you that really. I don't know if that's not an answer. The thing is, the, the easiest way to deal with offense is to have a tanker load of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 and of course, yeah. do you know that in this life you cannot totally avoid offense? Mm-hmm. Not at all. Mm-hmm. When you leave your heart in the morning, everyone is going to offend you. Sometimes you meet the wrong people. I read the video in my that make that change the way I look at people and I change the way I look at life. A man was coming out in a taxi and driving someone else. And he almost hit another car. And the car in front, the, way, the man came out furiously and was shouting and screaming and abusing. And the man that he was abused was really smiling and waving. You know, I imagine what some of us would do when someone is abusing you. You would yeah. go back and hit me the car and fight back. And the man made a statement and said that everyone has garbage. That's so the people on the street have garbage trucks. I hope so that they don't put their garbage on you. So that man came out from an office where he was offended and just to hit the road and offend everyone around him. But there was someone who chose not to be offended. When you remain like that, you break the cycle of offense. You know, so I don't transfer. Like you offend me, and I end up offending Mr. So he goes out on a thousand years and it becomes cycles of offense. And we can say that that offense ends with you. So if I respond to you the way you offend me, I choose to love you. No, it's okay. But just choose to love you despite who you are and what you have done for me. And what have I done? I have overcome that offense. The Bible says, overcome evil with good. I hope that answers your question. And I say, the word offense is a very powerful thing. Of course, between couples, it's a dangerous thing. It, it can break. The more you are offended, the more you are separated. The more you give, you give space to the devil. The devil keeps lodging in your room. And so every day, you need to do it. Now, forgiveness among couples requires some special skills. Yeah, because I was going to say, you make this thing sound so easy. No, they don't. I'm going to say to you right now, and you already forgive ahead of time. You understand? You're expected to forgive. If somebody said, okay, seven, 70 times seven, right? Yeah, um, someone will find you right now. You're like, um, I should forgive. Okay, so, okay, this is forgiveness in my heart. I'm giving it to you. It doesn't work that way, Pastor Bong. Sometimes, you, you just need to process whatever it is that has happened. And at other times, your booty, you know the way a computer boots. <laughs> yeah, you're not practical, right? Like, you're yeah. booting, you're trying to, like, oh, he actually did this to me. How could he have done this to me? I will not do this to him if I am in some shoe, right? So you're thinking about it. Why is it that he's, you know, doing this to me? So sometimes you're not having it so easy, Pastor. I know you're a pastor, and I know you, know you have the grace, right, to be able to forgive ahead of time and all that. But we need to know practical ways that we can work to forgiveness. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. What are the practical ways? Are there things we need to read ourselves of? Are there things we have in our mind that we should forget about for us to be able to, you know, just forgive someone and make an allowance for the person? How do we do this? 
as a couple, of course, you mentioned the couple, right? Mm -hmm. The couple, your wife offends you right now, and you're boiling within you. How do you readily, you know, pick forgiveness from where you pack them, your <laughs> shepherd, and just dish it when you want to dish it? Okay, I'm very glad you asked this question, and I'm really in love with this question because this is a practical life. Yeah. One of the things I did, I do every day, is to lower my expectations. Mm -hmm. Alright, so uh, if you're not expecting much, you will not be offended much. Do not agree with me. Alright, because what spoils unforgiveness and offense yeah. is the height and the depth of the expectation. So I come into a place not expecting. So no matter what you're going to do to me at that moment, I'm going to say that I wasn't expecting. I know. So I, I live my life not expecting. Most of the time, I live my life not expecting. So that it becomes glory be to God. If it does not come, glory be to God. I prepare my mind. It's a mind thing. So we learn to help people. The second thing is giving people allowance to fail. I make mistakes. Truly speaking, I do make mistakes. Yeah. So when the things I say I want to do, I'm not doing it to them. And I expect God to forgive me. And then why, why wouldn't I forgive someone? Why is it easy to forgive people with? Because you know you are forgiven. You see, the people that find it difficult to forgive people are the perfectionists. And they also know everything. We do everything. We do everything well. And because this is who you are and how you are, you find it difficult to forgive people. But for me, I know I make mistakes every day. And you know one of the things I, I do, I do to be very frank with you, I don't forgive easily, all right, personally. But one thing helps me. I kneel down to pray. And at the point of prayer, the Bible says that when you pray, mm -hmm. It is at the point of prayer that, that God will remind me about the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. the Holy Ghost of this world. So yeah. it is the place of prayer that I will release people most of the time. Because, you know, unforgiveness is like taking care of someone for someone else's illness. Mm -hmm. like you are taking pain for something else. You are the one that is feeling, you are the one that is feeling bad. So I will learn to forgive. Especially when I kneel down to pray. And when I will stand up from the place of prayer, it is gone. I just think that I just tell God, see, I don't like what this person did to me that for giving the person. Because my problem is to be honest, I wouldn't want to let you be the only one that all prayers are not answered. So that's what I'm saying. If you were not going to pray, you would never get to that point where you need to forgive the person. Well, unfortunately, it would be difficult to intentionally forgive someone. Okay. And because I'm a prayer person, one thing helps me. I know in my own way, but one thing really do help me. And every time I kneel down to pray, I know. If I regard iniquity in my heart, and unforgiveness is iniquity, unforgiveness is sin. All right, so I will forgive people first before telling God my prayers. It is a practice, it is a habit I make, so that I can help myself not be offended, so that I can live long. You know, because unforgiveness is one of the reasons why people lose their life very, you know, sadly. Do you know that, Pastor? You know, attention has a smell. Yeah. Yeah. Have you actually gotten yourself into an atmosphere where there's so much tension? Yeah. 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 I rode with a couple when I was in youth service in you know, 2013, and as soon as I got into this vehicle, I could feel this tension. I don't know if it has happened to you before. Like you get into a place, you could feel that there's something happening here. Things are not the way they should yeah. be, right? And that is also the same way that you get into a house and you feel like, ah, there's so much pressure here. Yes, and so for me, I do not like to experience that firsthand. Especially when you have children you're raising. You know, they grow up in that atmosphere where they are used to everybody doing their thing and all that. I never want to see that happen. So, yeah, you talked about prayer. Prayer is beautiful, but I'm actually talking about we as human beings. Mm -hmm. Even if there is no God to pray to, do you understand? Mm -hmm. I think I love my peace so much so that I do not ever want anything tamper with it. So I try to make sure that ah, there's no tension, anything that's going to make me, I like to smile, Pastor Bong. Yeah. Anything that's going to make me, you know, begin to tighten my face and all of that, I readily want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, some people are used to suffering and smiling. Yes. Some of us, you don't know how to do it. <laughs> like something is not okay. You mm -hmm. yeah. And you're trying to be cool. And at the same time, let's say, even as a pastor's wife, I'm not a pastor's wife, I'm just you know, <laughs> giving an instance, yeah. and you have to go to church, and your husband just offended you, yeah. and you're going to pray for people, and you're going to heal the sick, yeah. right? And so you get to church this way, you know, some of us, we now begin to pray at the altar, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we have not actually confessed our fault to the person we're supposed to confess it to. So I think there's a way to go around this whole thing. 
God is actually very important. I mean, God is the, is the, is the one person we should be, you know, at the right standing with. But I also feel like we're human beings. If we want to be able to, you know, let love lead the way we always say it, we should sincerely care for one another's feelings. And also know that the atmosphere is very important. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with me? Yeah, if, if, if I want to say something, um, I think communication is very hard for me. Even in the scriptures, the word, the Jesus was looking at the ground. Jesus was part of communication. So mm-hmm. I think he would have felt that way. He would have had some kind of him from prior information about what he should do now. And the same thing about the previous scripture of God as regards um, what the Lord gift at the altar. Mm-hmm. We should not communicate. Find that the resolution comes to one and say, okay, this is what happened. Because one thing I've not realized about that for being is that sometimes the election is not what you think it is. Sometimes you think you found it, but the person doesn't care to find it. But I said, it's easier to find it. Then we want the God of both of us. So we want the God of both of us. So we want the God of both of us. So we want the God of both of us. Communication. Communication. So that's, that's why I think when it goes a long way to helping him forgive. I don't think there are a lot of people who are in a circle who would intentionally want to hurt you. You understand? That's devilish. So that within the circle, so many things, I'm sure there should be an explanation. And as much as you know, if you also look at this side of the story, I think it's also easier to, okay, if I was on his shoe or on her shoe, probably that's the same way I would like to. So I think it makes forgiveness easier. And I mentioned prayer. Prayer is a communication. So I have to talk to God, God is talking back to you. Mm-hmm. Okay, look at this this way, look at that that way. I have to forgive you too. So I think everything boils down to talk about it, find find the common ground in your communication. That's that's what I feel. Okay, let me let me add to what you just said. Uh, I agree that prayer is pure communication. If there are people who are offended by their parents and their parents are late. Mm-hmm. Alright, so you you, you have to Two things I want to say. First, we will choose to forgive, but not because of the other person, but because yeah. of you. Yeah. Okay. You need to have a space where I really think that I'm really offended. But the person on the other end doesn't feel one right way. When you are talking, you are the one that are offended. The other person is not, is cutting cruise. Yeah. You are having a good time. But you are dying on this side. Because you, you have done that thing, there's, there's an adage in the language that says, it is not the person that causes the problem or the mess is the mess that actually feels the pain. It is someone that comes into that mess and comes to the room with that mess. I you and to that for a So most times, people take actions and the other person is the one that is feeling the impact of the action. And many times, I told myself, I don't really need to forgive because of the other person. I forgive because me and my heart needs to be clear. Mm-hmm. My mind needs to be pure. I can't do what I'm doing with a bitterness. I can't, I can't pass through with something wrong in my heart. Yes. So many times, we settle the matter before we go out there. Mm-hmm. Many times, I just said, okay, please, I need you. Can we just let me leave? My last is to go. Yes. So that I can let go of the bitterness and the pain. And my heart is right. The other thing that you can also forgive the person, especially when that person is not in your space, so that your heart can be free. I must say this, um, I used to get very, 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 very offended by my parents, especially my father. I grew up bitter in some part of my life, not very really bitter with him. Something happened, and then when my life goes back, uh, one two elephants are fighting. You know, who is the one that suffers more in the class? The girls. Mm-hmm. And so we grew up and we really had a lot of bad times. And so I grew up with this bitterness against him. All right, so now I become an adult. I've been able to do well, but in my depth of heart, yeah. I'm still feeling that whenever I recall experiences as a young child, it becomes back my memory. So at some point in my life, I have to ask myself a question. Mm-hmm. Are you going to continue with the pain and the bitterness that this man caused, or are you going to let go? I can't forget that day. I lay down in my house, and I saw tears in my eyes. I was crying, and I lay down, and I told God, I forgive this man. Mm. He's dead and long gone, you know, long, long gone, but I had to forgive him. And the point I let go, talking about let go now, yeah. I felt this 
peace in your heart. I felt the joy. I knew that something was related. But I was carrying the pain, the trauma of the spirit of the young child. You know, I was still accusing you of many things. And from that day, I did. From that day till now, I've never spoken ill of that man. I have made up my mind as a choice that I will never because I have let go of the heart. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, people watching right now, believers, it just might cost you nothing to just let go. Mm-hmm. Let go is the key. When you hold on to things for too long, my yeah. husband went to you, this is 25 years, you're still hurt. You know, you're still hurt, you're right? Mm-hmm. Right. This woman got hurt by a man, and the man left him, left her. I said, every day, that woman will wake up and say, I cost you, you must die. She will pray and don't give her that. But the man was living in that. I don't know how to the story. So, the man was living in that. Living in that. Five years past, she was still crossing the man. Five years past, she was still The man was still doing well. And one day, she went down to pray. And the first thing was part one. We've been praying for me to kill this man. Or we've been praying for this man to die. For this number of years, the man did not die. Why don't you pray for me to forgive him? Mm. And today, still has it that. Immediately, she knelt down with tears in her eyes. But after 25 years, I hear 25 solid years, she knelt down and cried and told God from today, I forgive you. I pray that you should bless him. The Bible says, Bless what? Your enemies. She began to bless the man. The story has it that they didn't believe the man died. She had a heart accident and died. Now, so, if that story is any way true, I would say the moment she let go of the heart, of that man, God judged the man. I said, that's what the Bible says, don't go to your enemies. Because sometimes, what is really keeping God from judging your enemy? Because you too are judging him. So, what you cannot judge? The moment you let go of that, God decides to judge. So, I want to tell you, today might be the day to let go of the hurt that your spouse has hurt you. This is the moment to say, I forgive you and I bless you. Even your parents, when you say that's what you, that's my day, the right time to let go. And I can tell you when you let go, God will fill your heart with love and you can love again and you will restore your joy or salvation. So I think that a lot of people are, you know, going through one disease or the other. You have sicknesses that have lasted for so long a time and you go to hospital, you go for lab tests and there's still nothing. Mm. You know, sometimes it's bitterness, envy, resentment. We talked about last week that um, the Bible says that Mary had those with like Mary. Yeah. So when your heart is not Mary, when you have envy, bitterness in your heart, most of the time you end up being ill. I've seen it happen. I told you I went to a hospital, I met this woman, and she said, oh, I did not even know when cancer happened. But I realized that it was after I became so bitter with my spouse, I couldn't forgive him because of the very many hurtful things he did to me. And I couldn't even find it. You know the way somebody offends you and you're looking for a premise? You know, you just want to have something, one good thing, that you can say, okay, because of this, let me let go. She, she didn't see anything. There was no premise for forgiveness. You know, she said, so... As I was just getting, you know, so bitter and all of that, I began, I began to come down with so much sicknesses. Mm. Today she's having this one. Tomorrow is high blood pressure because as you're imprisoning someone in your mind, you're not free yourself. Yeah. So when you let yourself, you know, get so bitter about a situation or about someone who has hurt you, there's a way it falls on your health too. So if you actually do love yourself, you should be able to free your mind of every hurt every envy, resentment, bitterness, and be able to just let God judge the person. God is the best judge, isn't he? That's true. That's yeah. true. So let God deal with whoever it is that he wants to deal with, but you should be able to do your part so that your prayers will not be hindered. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, do you have any other God? Because me, I haven't just one God. <laughs> so I try to be sure that, oh, if not for any other thing, I want to go back to him and make my prayers and be very sure that he hears me. Okay, but I think we should move on to something. Yeah. You know, I get a revelation for two verse four. The God was saying, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast me thou has let thy first yes, love. Yeah. And that reminds me of uh, a couple of couples. You know, the day you get married, you were, uh, you know, excited. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, after two years of the marriage, you are going to lose the love. After ten years or nine, you're now strangers. After twenty five years or now enemies. So, so no oneness is one thing that affects marriage and um, love generally. Then selfishness is a problem. You are thinking about you and you and you and you and you. We, we, we can talk about that for one day. Yeah. You know, because we are one of the things that kills love is self 
is this the last one that I want to talk about is past hurts and the wounds of love. Now, if somebody comes into marriage and he was he or she was wounded by someone before now, and you are coming into marriage, and every action that this person is taking reminds you of something that someone has done to you, and the person begins to hurt you because you are wounded, you are wounded by love, and you are coming to love to someone because you are wounded. You can't let that person into maximum capacity because that wound is still there, it's still fresh. People will rape and they come into the marriage and the husband holds you and is about to play, wants to start, you know, some, some romance and fellowship and then you are responding as though this is the one that raped you. Mm. And I want to tell you this, this is something that I can talk about because it's key. Yeah. People get traumatized, so they come into marriage with the trauma. And now, because they were hurt, they hurt people. So past hurt and wounds of love has become a major, major reason why people cannot love. Anymore, you go to the church, the pastor gives you or offends you, and when you come to a new church and you think that this is how all pastors are, you know, I was like speaking about yeah, yeah. it happens. Yeah. You go to the place, and this is where you were treated by a boss. You now come into it, a certain business, and you are thinking that this is exactly how this boss is because you were hurt and you can't love with those pastors. It's a very terrible thing. You are. The love of my life, you are the hope that I cling to. I Strikes a chord in your spirit more than the others. Lukewarmness, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, that's the most. I, I, we have a tendency to be looking on after a while. Mm-hmm. We have a tendency, yeah. How about you, Minister Ezel? Well, uh, the lack of forgiveness is a major issue yeah. for most, you know, kinds of relationships. So I think we need to find the root of that and deal with it. Do you see um, anything about conversation, Pastor Ron? That this conversation we talk about, you know, relating with your spouse, is also the same way with God. Yeah, the same way. Same way. Because at some point, you now begin to see God like, um, it's much more like a contract. I need, give me, I am here for this and that. But how about that relationship where you just go and you kneel down at the feet of your father and you tell him, I'm just here to tell you how much I love you. I don't know yeah. how often we get to do that. Yeah. Like, God, I am not here to complain. Yes. You know, literally, yeah. you know, that song about my many problems. I am just here to say I love you. It can be difficult sometimes, but we need to be able to cultivate that habit of always getting to God to just say, I'm just here to say thank you. Yeah. I mean, if I have breath in my nostrils, I believe that if you said you would do it, you yeah. definitely yeah. would do it. Because why? God is a God of constant character. In Him, there is no wilderness. Neither is the shadow of turning. Has He said it? He will bring it to pass. Oh my God. First of all. <laughs> yeah, so love is such a beautiful topic to talk about. I don't even know. Have we exhausted this topic? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, so love is such a beautiful topic to talk about. To think that this thing is something we experience every day. You shared, uh, you know, that um, story of how you were traveling and you had an instinct, you know, to leave a vehicle. Yeah. And afterwards, you saw that, oh, there was an accident on the way. Yeah. So what other expressions of love, what can even be more than this expression of love? You know, where God, you know, gives you a nod in your spirit. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't go there. So there's always the whole prompting. God prompting us to do something or not to do something. This love language, first of all, let's revisit that thing you talked about. Very fearful thing, that the love language of God is so winning. <laughs> you know, that's very fearful. For some of us, not into so winning. Because some of us, you, I sent you something during this. Some of us feel like, okay, um, how do I go winning so? Do I go stand on the road? Do I use the megaphone? Do I do this? Do I do that? But every day you get into your office, you get into your workplace, is an opportunity for you not just to preach with your mouth, but your way of living, your character. There has to be something spectacular that someone notices about you. And the person is like, I need to know this guy better. Then I need to know why this guy is behaving the way he's behaving. Well, I, I believe that every day we meet people. Yeah. Every day. Every time. Every day. We meet people. And every way we meet people, we must know them better than the way they were. And I believe that that is more evangelism. Yeah. Than just preaching what the Bible is saying. Mm. We thank you for staying with us through this time. And we are very much happy that you have heard the word that we have been able to share with you. And this is the word of God. I mean, all scriptures are inspired by God. Everything you have heard here, they were all inspired by God. And Bible said they are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the Son of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So, as you go about your daily routine or your activities during this week, we want to be very sure that you're able to tackle those enemies of love and get back here on our next episode with testimonies of how you have overcome. We love you and we want you to be good, stay tuned, and get to see you next time on this show. God bless you. Bye for now. Faith is the demonstration of absolute trust in the midst of unforeseen realities. One Faith is a program designed to bring you stability in your journey of faith in God.